Hey, well, good morning, Christ Church. It is so good to be in the house of God with you this morning. Rustin and Starlington, we love you guys. So thankful for what God is doing in your communities. But aren't you thankful for the presence of Jesus that's in here in the room today? I'm thankful that when we show it, we bring him with us and we just feel his presence so strongly um, today. I will say, I do want to say thank you to everyone that was a part of this weekend of the 24 hours of prayer. Thank you for just coming in, diving in, praying for our church, praying for our community, praying for the, those lost souls in our community, praying for revival, which is happening this week. Somebody say, revival is this week. 6.30, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night. We want you to be here for it. It's going to be an amazing time. As a matter of fact, we want you to invite somebody with you. How many of you say, Ryan, you know what? I will invite somebody to, be a, with, to come with me in the revival services. Come on, raise your hand. If you say, Ryan, you know what? I will make sure, I'll be intentional about bringing someone with me. I promise you, if you'll get them here, we're not going to do something strange to them. We're going to love on them, and they're going to experience the presence of God. That sounded weird, didn't it? But, what do we say? People are weird. The Holy Spirit isn't weird. <laughs> but man, uh, I heard a heard a story this morning in a staff meeting, and it was a it was about a CC a, a kid in CC Kids that uh, he came to church and he went back to school and went and t- was telling his teacher what he had learned in school. But it just so happens his teacher was an agnostic. And he goes and he looks at his teacher and says, you won't believe what I learned in CC Kids. She was like, what? He was like, there's a guy named Jonah and he was swallowed by a whale. And the teacher, who's an agnostic, says, nah, we know that's not scientifically possible. We know that the esophagus of the whale can't expand that much for a human body to get down the throat of the whale. And the little boy looks at his teacher and says, well, when I get to heaven, I'm gonna find Jonah and I'm gonna ask him, did you get swallowed by a whale? And the teacher really quickly smarted, by, smart, smarted off to him and says, well, what if he's not in heaven? What if he's in hell? And the boy looks at her and says, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> uh, that's not a true story, but it's funny. And as a matter of fact, my dad told us that one this morning. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I do believe I have something from the Lord for us today. A couple of weeks ago, I was just resting in the presence of the Lord in my own personal devotion and quiet time. And as I was just kind of sitting there with the Lord, my, my mind just began to dream a little bit. It began to dream about what the future could look like for us here at Christ Church. And I just, to be honest with you, my mind just started going wild and I started getting inside, uh, excited on inside of me. My spirit was getting fired up. And as I began to dream, it, it was almost like it's, I could picture from my, almost like a helicopter's view. Like I'm just looking down and I was looking down at, a, at our churches. And as I was looking down, I could just see people lined up on the outside of our churches waiting to get in. People experienced freedom. People experiencing salvation. Healings were happening. People were being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, chains falling off. Marriages finding healing and being restored. And again, I was getting excited as I was just kind of peering in in my own mind's eye. As a matter of fact, I just want you to close your eyes at all of our campuses right now. And I just want you to begin to imagine with me. Imagine if you're, you're driving up to your church, maybe it's down Celebrity Drive, or maybe it's right there on 165 or 7th Street or Cypress, and as you begin to come get closer to the buildings, you just begin to see tons of people outside. They're in lines, wrapping around the building. Can you imagine it? Can you picture it in your own mind? They're just waiting to get in. Now, keep your eyes closed and just keep imagining. Now you're inside the worship service. And they're singing and we're praising God and you look over to your left and maybe you see some people jumping for joy in the presence of God. Can you see them? And then maybe on the right you look over and there's folks that are kneeled down and they're crying out to God. And they're not there because of some person. They're not there because of some great music. They're there because the presence of Jesus is there. And there you are, 
Just imagine. There you are right in the middle of it all. And as you're standing there, the Holy Spirit, he's ministering to your soul. He's ministering to, to your marriage, to your family. Maybe you look over and, and, and in your mind you can just see, oh, I see my teenage son over there. I, I see my prodigal daughter. She's over there. She's got her arms stretched towards heaven. Can you imagine it? This is where I was at. And I was just imagining all the things that God wants to do, what the next season for us as a body of believers might look like. And I just started getting excited. <laughs> I, almost uncontainable excitement about this moment. You can open your eyes, sorry. I don't want any of y'all to fall asleep. I mean, is your spirit getting stirred right now? Just imagining what it could be like for your family to be ministered to, for God to pour his spirit out onto your kids, onto your sons and your daughters and your grandkids. This is what I want us to do at all of our churches. I know this is a little different, but I want us all just to stand right now. I know we've been up and down a little bit, but I want us for the next 10 seconds I don't want us to give a feeble praise to God for what he's doing and what he's going to do. I want us to give the, the best praise that we have deep in our soul. I want us to cry out thank you to God. Come on, can you help me? He deserves our praise. He deserves our adoration. Come on now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy, for your salvation, for your healing, for great provision. God, you do what only you can do and measurably more, more than we can count, more than we can number, God. You do it only what you can do, God. Pour out your spirit on us, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> Woo. You can be seated. So as I was meditating and I was just pondering in this moment, this thought came to me and I believe it was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. And it was just simply two words. And it was be ready, be ready. And I wish I could stand here today and tell you what that exactly means. <laughs> but I, I would just be lying. I don't completely understand everything, all the facets of what that could potentially mean for us and, and for our body here is just be ready. Be ready. So I was like, all right, God, I'm gonna let you reveal it to me. I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna walk this thing out. I'm just gonna continue following you. I'm gonna continue pursuing you and everything that you want for us. And I, I, I'm just praying that you're gonna unfold it before my eyes. But at the base level of be ready, I can at least start there. So be ready. I'm just gonna start at the very bottom of it all. And be ready, for me, it, it brings value across every aspect of our lives, being ready does. Being ready speaks to our, our anticipation about the things that might come. Being ready speaks to our ability to respond effectively to the things that might come, right? Like you're ready, I'm ready to go. In other words, when they pull the trigger at the start of the race, you're not frantically looking for your shoes. But when they pull the trigger to start the race, you've got your shoes on, you've got them laced up and you're ready to fire off the block. And for us as a body of believer, I just believe that the Holy Spirit is saying, I need you to be ready. I don't need you scrambling around trying to put the pieces together when it's time. I need you to be ready to fire off the block. I mean, this is what Paul told his protege Timothy. He says, I need you to be ready. I want you to be ready in season, but I want you to be ready out of season. So as I was just praying through this be ready idea, I came to this understanding. The only way that you can be ready is through preparation. You can't become ready if you don't have any preparation. Every racer knows that the beginning of the race doesn't start, begin at the starting line. 
Every business professional knows that landing the big contract doesn't start with signing the contract. Every parent knows that having a high school graduate doesn't start at the high school graduation ceremony. It's through preparation that you put yourself in a position to be ready. That's how you get ready. It's through preparation. And so my question for the big question for us as a, as, as a body, but even more specifically to you as individuals, how ready are you? If God says move, are you ready to move? Are you gonna be scrambling around looking and trying to put some things together so that you can move? How prepared are you? I mean, I think we all understand that we're only as strong as our weakest link. So yes, does our pastors, are we prepared? Do we need to be prepared? Do we need to be ready? Absolutely. Does our team lead? Do they need to be ready? Yes. But every single one of us that are a part of this body needs to be prepared and ready to go and do whatever God has called us to do. Be ready. If God says go right now, are we ready to go? Are you ready to go? Not your neighbor, not your spouse, but are you ready to go? In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells us this story of, about an engagement of sorts. And I think we can learn from it. But before I read it, there's a couple of things that I want us to understand that makes the story a little bit more clear. Number one, who is Jesus talking to? He was talking to Jewish first century a Jewish first century audience. As a matter of fact, through the research that I've, I've, I've done on this scripture, most likely it would have been some of his closest disciples. Maybe even, not, not just the 12, but maybe even some outside of the 12. That's the first thing that you know. He's talking to a first century Jewish audience. The second thing is, is what did a normal Jewish engagement look like? What was common in this idea? What did it look like for them? So from the groom's perspective, when you got married as a Jewish man, it was very contractual. It's, it's about as close to an arranged marriage as you can without being an arranged marriage. So they would, this young man, he would, you know, try to find a girl that, he thought was suitable for himself. And, you know, most of the time it would have been somebody that would have been maybe at this, at, at his same level, you know, might try to get outside of his level. I mean, I'm looking at all the guys in the room here and you know what I'm talking about because you married up too, didn't you? Um, and so then he would go and make a deal with the dad. Not with the girl, with the dad. And he would go and they would barter and they would, a lot of times it was, uh, animals that were swapped or given for th his right to marry this man's daughter. And once the contract was essentially signed, he would then leave and he would go back to his own home, most likely his parents' home, and then building on to his parents' home a place that now he can live with his future bride. Maybe that's a lean-to off to the side. Maybe that's a whole big nice part I don't know, but he would stay and he would work and build this place for him and his future bride to live before they ever got married. On the bride side, now she understands that she's engaged to be married to this guy. Doesn't know him that well probably. Doesn't know when he's gonna come and get her. So she's basically sitting on go at all times waiting. It's today the day. It's the day to day that my, my, my future husband comes and he takes me to be his bride. Don't know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be two weeks from now. It could be two years from now. I just, I don't know. I just have to be ready for when he comes. Then you had the bridesmaids perspective. And the bridesmaids, they were there basically to roll out the red carpet for the groom as he came to get the bride. That was their only job. And so just like the bride, they had to be ready. They had to be waiting. And so Jesus tells them this story that I believe that really brings us and gives us some clarity about our preparation. It's in Matthew 25. And it begins like this. This is Jesus talking. He says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish 
and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take extra olive oil or extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by a shout. Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, please give us your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were going to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, the other five bridesmaids returned. They stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch. You must keep watch. Just like Everything that Jesus says, <laughs> they're just loaded with principles and it's loaded with so many different angles and different facets. But today, I just want to talk to us for the next couple of minutes about a couple of things that jumped off the page at me concerning our preparation. And the first thing is this. If you're taking notes, like Dad says, and I wish you were, easy isn't always best. Easy isn't always best. What's the old saying? Work smarter, not harder. But working smarter isn't about easy. And I just think that we live in a culture. We live in a society where most people are walking around thinking, what's easiest? What's the least that I can do to get by? I don't want to do any more than I have to. What's the least amount that I can do? Can I just help you this morning? If you want to go where God wants to take you, you can't rely on what's the least amount. You can't operate with that type of mentality. As a matter of fact, you, can, you, 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 can't, you can't only operate in today what, what God gave you yesterday. And I think so many of us try to do that. And look, we can look back. We can remember how God blessed us then and how he was so faithful then. But we don't, we're not called to operate in today of what he gave us yesterday. I mean, last Sunday was amazing. Mario brought an incredible word. I'm so thankful for his gifts. And I know it ministered to your soul, but we can't rely on last Sunday. Today is a new day and you need what God has for you today. Yesterday's encounter may have given you a little energy. It may have given you some excitement, but where God wants to take you, you don't need less. You actually need more. You need more of his power. You need more of his presence. You need more of his strength and more of his wisdom. Our best approach is not to look for easy, but to ask Jesus, what do you want to do today? What do you have for me this morning? Look, I can say this. I'm glad Jesus wasn't looking for easy. As a matter of fact, he says, actually, he says, not my will, but your will be done. And let me just tell you, the beating wasn't easy. The thorns wasn't easy. The spikes that were driven into his hands and feet, that wasn't easy. Your sin, your shame, my sin, my shame, it wasn't easy. For us to be prepared isn't the easy way. It's not what our flesh is going to want to do. For us to be prepared, what it looks like is us, maybe us getting up a little bit early to pray instead of waiting to the last minute and to sleep a another five minutes or another 30 minutes and say, you know what? I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna prepare myself for my day. So I'm gonna get up an extra 30 minutes so that his spirit can fill me up for today. Like what Paul wrote wrote in Ephesians 5, be filled with the spirit. To be prepared looks like, hey, I'm gonna make sure that I'm reading. I'm gonna make sure that I'm meditating on God's word so that I'm not some malnourished Christian. This is what Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Maybe being prepared for you looks like surrounding yourself with some like-minded believers. 
Do you have some people in your corner that's cheering you on as you're running this race? Or maybe that you have some people in your corner that when you fall down, they're there to help you pick you back up. I mean, it's, uh, it's Solomon who told us two is better than one. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And then you add three, a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It might be hard, but it's better. It might be hard, but it will sustain you. And some of these bridesmaids, they were just thinking easy. What's the easy? What's the easy? What's the least that I can do to get by? But then you have the wise ones and they were thinking, give me some jars, but don't just give me some jars. Give me some extra jars. I need, I want a little bit extra oil. I need more oil, more oil because I'm not going to miss this moment. I don't want to miss it. I want to be prepared. I find it inter interesting that no one told them that he was going to take a long time. No one told any of them. They just thought, you know what? I need to be prepared. I don't know what's coming. I don't know what this next season is going to look like, but I want to make sure that I'm prepared for whatever God has for me. Whatever he wants me to do, I want to make sure that I'm ready, that I'm prepared for what he's doing. The next thing that jumped off the page to me is this. It's a new day. The Bible says at midnight. Somebody say midnight. midnight. It struck me. Midnight begins the new day. And then I just started thinking. Then I remember another midnight in Bible, in the Bible. Acts chapter 16. You might remember it says around midnight, Paul and Silas. Here they are bound up in a prison cell in chains. And around midnight, they started singing praises to God. And what does it say? It says suddenly, suddenly the earth began to shake. And the foundations began to shake. And the prison doors, they flung open. All their chains fell off. It was at midnight. It's a new day. We need to understand, yesterday is gone. I can't change yesterday. What I did in my past is gone. Midnight, it's a brand new day. And maybe some of you are here and, you, and in your own mind right now, you're thinking, well, I know Ryan, I haven't been preparing the way that I should have. Okay, good self-assessment, but today is a new day. Today is a day of preparation. It's a new season for you to prepare yourself. Because here's the key. You can't approach the new season like you approach the old season. Many of you know, last October I got married. Before that I was single for four years. Four lonely years. And in those four years I began to do some things a certain way. But then I got married. <laughs> and let's just say, I can't operate the same way as I used to operate. I can't just put my dirty clothes where I used to put my dirty clothes. And I just want to tell you, in this season that God has for you, there are some old things that you're going to have to lay down. There's some old patterns that you're gonna have to step out of. There's some mindsets, some old mindsets that you have that you need to have them renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hebrews 12 says, let, let us strip off every weight, every old way of thinking, every old habit, every old pattern, let's strip it all away. That might slow us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. The old isn't going to work in the new. It just doesn't. You got to step out of the old. You got to step in to what God is wanting you to do. It's a new day. It's a new day. Somebody say, it's a new day. And I want us to be people. I want us to be a family. I want us to be a church that, is, that stops trying to live on yesterday's mercy and to step into the new mercy that he has for us today. I want us to step into the new grace that he has for us tomorrow. I want us to continue to step into the forgiveness that he has for us tomorrow, for the healing that he has for us tomorrow. I don't want us just relying on what he did yesterday. Thank God for yesterday. I celebrate yesterday, but I want us to be people that are willing and prepared and ready to step into what he has for us right now, today. The last thing is this, is to stay focused. 
Stay focused. Can I just tell you, the devil doesn't want you to experience what God has in store for you. He doesn't want you to. And he's willing to use whatever he can to hold you out, hold you back from stepping in to what God has in store for you. It's, it's, it's King Solomon that told us, it's the little foxes that ruin the vines. It's the little things. And the devil is willing to use whatever he can. You know, can I just say this? He'll use your family. He'll use your career. He'll use your hobbies. He'll use some offense that somebody, somebody didn't say something to me right or I walked through church and she didn't even talk to me or he didn't even shake my hand. They, he will use whatever he can to steal your oil from you. That's what he, we know his tactics. We know his schemes. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you can have life. The devil wants to steal your own. Oh, so we have to stay focused. We have to make sure that, that we keep our hearts and our minds aligned with Jesus, with his spirit, and make sure that there's not some distractions over here or some distractions over there that we put our focus on that and we miss the, we miss the bridegroom coming. We miss what he's trying to do in our lives. We gotta stay focused. I want us to be a people. I want us to be a church that we do Step into everything that God has in store for us, but it's gonna take not just some of us, it's gonna take us all. Yeah. Saying, you know what? I need to prepare. There's some things I gotta, I gotta shift up in my life. I, there's some things I gotta do a little differently. There's some ways that I used, to, I used to do it this way, but you know what? I gotta shift some things around. I gotta begin to do things a little bit different. Can't, gotta stay focused. Can't get distracted. There's some of you that came today and, and even as we're talking about this, you realize in your own life that you've been distracted. And, and maybe it's by a great career. Maybe it's by the idea of having more money so that you can have more things. Maybe it's the idea of, hey, I'm not inherently bad things, but hey, I... I I, I, want, I want to have the best marriage on the planet. And so I, I just burn everything else. I burn all this shit. And I just, all I do is work on my marriage and I leave God out of it. You just gotten distracted by some things in your life and you, it came today. I don't believe it's by accident. I believe it's by divine appointment. The guys, I believe that he's calling you home. And that he's saying, hey, I've got something good for you. I've got life. I've got freedom. I've got peace. Come on, somebody. How many of you need some peace in your life? I've got some joy. I've got grace. I've got mercy. Everything that you think these other things are going to provide for you, I'm the answer. Those things are going to leave you come up short every single time. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you're right there in Ruston or Sterlington. Maybe you're in this room right now, but you know, as you just think about your own life, that, hey, you know what? I've just gotten a little distracted. Maybe you used to be on fire for Jesus, and today you look and you know, hey, I've just drifted. I'm not doing the, I'm not doing the basic things that his word calls me to do. So I just want you to bow your heads. And that, that sense that you're feeling right now, that's not the food that you ate last night or the kolache that you ate this morning. That's, that's the Holy Spirit just trying to nudge you, just trying to bring to the surface of your own lives some things that, hey, you know what? It's a new day. I'm not gonna do things the way that I used to do them. I'm gonna do something different. And today, today is the day of salvation. So maybe you're here and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Or maybe you're here and you know, you just need to rededicate your life. You need to get some priorities back in order. And I just want you to slip up your hand. No one's looking around. 
This is a moment between you and God. Be bold. Come on, slip it up high. I want to see them. Thank you for those hands. We're just going to pray. The Bible says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You will be saved. It also says that he is a faithful God that will forgive us of our sins if we just ask. We're just going to pray a simple prayer. And I say this all the time, but I really can't comprehend the transaction that happens as we begin to pray, as we begin to turn our hearts towards Jesus. But supernaturally, he takes all of our sin away and he nails it to the cross and we are covered by his blood. So we're gonna pray together, our church family, we're gonna pray with our friends that raised their hands today. So as one voice out loud, can we just pray? Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you came, you lived a sinless life and willingly gave it up for me. I'm asking you to forgive me. I'm turning from my old ways. I'm turning towards you. I believe that you are my savior. I put my faith in you. I put my trust in you. And I'm gonna follow you for the rest of my days. I believe you have incredible things in store for my life. And I wanna be ready for everything that you have.